Really? All right. Come on. Come on up. No African today. You coming or not? Blessing. And this guy is precious to me. Um, I just want to just take a moment. And uh, this is a faithful man. Actually, uh, the way that we came in contact with him, it it was something that the Lord uh, wanted to do. We were asking the Lord. We want somebody to be able to sow into to, to, to into a place. And, um, and so we're thankful for you. Wow. We're thankful for you and your wife and your faithfulness. Yeah. And um, sometimes you don't see all like the stars and all this kind of stuff. Like, ah. But I'm telling you, this is a faithful, yeah. faithful family. Yeah. And they paid the price. And we just say thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We love you. We, love you. Yeah. We, are, we serve a faithful God. Amen. Amen. And uh, my beautiful bride of many, many years now, I always, I always get it one, or, uh, one less or one too many. I have a t- 38. The reason I say that is because I, I'm, I'm always thinking it's been so good, you know, that it's been 39. But um, you, can, you can be seated. You can be seated. But we met when we were 17 years old. And uh, both of us grew up in Missouri. I was from St. Louis. She's from a little town of 687 people. And we just got back, as a matter of fact, from St. Louis. We were at meetings with uh, Brother Copeland in St. Louis. Uh, I guess it was Thursday and Friday. Got in here yesterday. And um, it was a special time because we're rarely in our home state. We left the United States in 1992. And really have never lived in, the, the, in America since then. And uh, don't have any family to, really in, in St. Louis anymore. But as I was sitting there, I realized, I, I hadn't really thought about it. But there was a picture of, of the riverfront of St. Louis with the arch and, and a hotel that was, that's kind of uh, encadré, we say in French, uh, that's, that's framed within the, the, the arch. And, and I, all of a sudden it hit me. I was in that hotel room, I'm not really proud to say this, but as a, as a teenager, I was on the journalism staff of our high school newspaper, and, and we decided it would be a good idea to have a, a party in the hotel room, and we got caught, and our parents were called, and I had a week's vacation from school uh, suspended, and, um, but you know what, and I wasn't even repentant. I had given my life to Jesus and there's a reason I'm sharing all this. It's going to go into what we're going to be sharing today. But I gave my life to Jesus when I was 10, following the divorce of my parents. But I had this rocky roller coaster uh, walk with the Lord, you know, as a yo-yo Christian up, up and down, up and down, up and down, until one day I decided, oh, forget it. I'm just going to have fun. And when I was about 15 or so, and just had a, a, a short, praise God, period of rebellion. And so even after we were... Busted at the hotel room and, and uh, for our beer party, and, and, uh, and that actually got a couple traveling salesmen fired because they're the ones that bought the, the goodies for our crew. But all that to say is I wasn't really even repentant. I was like, oh, well, I get a week's vacation. But we're talking about a faithful God. We're talking about Jesus who needs to be preached to everyone and everywhere, right? And what... I never fail to be amazed at his goodness, his grace, his mercy, because the middle of that week of my vacation, <laughs> I was sitting on the couch, everybody else was in bed, it was about midnight, the lights were mostly out, and all of a sudden this godly sorrow that leads to repentance came over me. And uh, I was thinking about this just a couple of days ago because I'm sitting there looking at this hotel room where that's what the, where all this started, and uh, I went to bed that night, not really re- repenting verbally. I didn't say anything, but something was stirring in my heart, and I went to bed, and I experienced Psalm 127.3, where the word says that the Lord gives to his beloved even in their sleep, and I had a powerful encounter with the living God. You know, your spirit man doesn't sleep. My mind was maybe sleeping. My body was asleep, but I had a powerful experience with my heavenly Father, and I, I, I ceded my will to his will. I, I, I said yes to the will of God in my life. And I woke up that next morning and just was directed supernaturally. I, I walked 
through the house into the room where my mom had her Christian books. And I, I went straight to a book that talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I read three pages and I said, Lord, I need that. And I knew about it because I'd been in church since I was 10. And I asked to be filled with the Holy Ghost right there in my living room all alone. I started speaking in other tongues and the enemy said, oh, you're just making that up. And I said, Anyway, long story short, I, I just kept praying in tongues, and the Spirit of God came over me, and there was no emotion to it until about 20 minutes into it, I'd started thinking about just how merciful, how good and gracious God is, amen? I made a decision. I said, Lord, I'm never going to be a fence rider anymore. I'm not going to have, you know, uh, be riding the fence. We say... Um, in French, we say, uh, un pied dans l'église, un pied dans le monde, one, one foot in, in, in the church and one foot in the world. I'm going to, whatever it takes, I'm going to go and preach the gospel to everyone, yeah. everywhere. <laughs> and it really started right there. S 16, I, was, I wasn't even 17. It was a, I believe it was the month of November. So it was almost the day 40 years ago, because that was 1983. In around October, November of, of 1983 when that happened. And so we've seen God's faithfulness over 40 years. Yes. Faithful is he who called you, and he will do it. And we've made plenty of mistakes, and it's not always been easy. And, and there's been a lot of times we think, but I would like to have a retake on that one. But we, can't, we don't get any retakes. But we, what we do get is forgetting what lies behind, reaching for what lies ahead. We press towards that upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. And we're going to get into the word in a minute. I wanted to share with you, first of all, uh, just a good report of what you're doing in the nations outside of, of this wonderful nation. But, um, you know, we're, I, we're going to get into that. But I just believe that the Spirit of God is wanting to do something in the service today. We don't want to just share some stories and, and have a, a, a sermon and, and say, amen, just to say amen, we want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. We want to respond to it. And I love what Pastor Nate said, the, the power of that amen, to put ourselves in agreement with what we're hearing, not just with our minds, but we're hearing in our hearts from Jesus, the head of the church, the one who gave his life for us, the one who sacrificed his all for us so that we, huh, who, who were completely unworthy and, and undeserving of his mercy and his grace and his love so that we who were unrighteous might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. How many of you are grateful for that? So um, I just want to share with you a few, few good reports. How many of you are ready to hear some good reports? This church has been such a blessing. Pastor Nate and Evan have been such a blessing to us personally. We're really grateful. We don't have words to express how much you've uh, touched our lives in so many ways. And this congregation as well. We don't know all of you, but there's several of you that we've had the opportunity to, to get to know. And now we love this church. And we know that Jesus loves this church. And, and there's a great plan and purpose for it. But we're partners together. You sow into this ministry. So what that means is, is this. It's what Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 4. He said as he was going into Macedonia, he had no other church uh, that, that, that entered into this partnership in the way that the Philippian church did. And what, what Paul ex expressed there was not only gratitude, but also an assurance that because you have sown into the ministry that he was called to, to bring the gospel to the pagan nations, because of that, that's going to mean fruit that abounds to your account. Amen? He says, I'm not looking for a gift. I'm looking for fruit that abounds to your account. So you're going to see a little bit of fruit that abounds to your account. Amen? So I'm going to show you two two-minute videos, okay? And, and, I, and, and, um, and then I'm just going to follow it up with a couple other pictures because every, every image you see, every testimony you hear, you can know that Beyond Church is a huge part of that. Amen? So can we go ahead and play, um, we're going to play just two things, one from Haiti, one from the Congo. Uh, these were made a few months back by my son, but so I'll have to, after the videos, give a couple updates, but uh, are those going to work? If they do, that would be great, and if not, but Rayma Haiti launched in 2012 with 320 students. 
the result of decades of collaboration from an international team of Rhema grads sharing a vision to bring Rhema to the nations of the French-speaking world. After nine years of operations and three graduating classes, civil unrest, a presidential assassination, gang violence and kidnappings made it necessary to suspend classes for over a year. In 2022, as Ray Mahaney prepared to celebrate 10 years of existence, a strong witness of the Spirit confirmed it was time to resume operations. To keep students from traveling through the most dangerous war zones, the relaunch was planned in two locations. Students from the South would attend the main campus with a live instructor, with those from the North assembling in another city to follow in real time on the big screen via Zoom. Beyond Church the road from the airport big cut off, campus coordinators Andy and Ruth Joseph took precarious mountain routes to reach the main campus and prepare the team to receive students. Supernaturally passing through checkpoints of heavily armed warlords, they attribute their safe arrival to angelic protection. In addition to the constant menace of kidnapping and violence, the economic situation was bleak with widespread shortages. Chickens, eggs, and even bread were almost impossible to come by. Following God's wisdom and a prompting of the Spirit, the food needed to offer a daily hot meal to students was finally brought in from the Dominican Republic. In spite of the challenges, on November 17, 210 new students arrived, hungry for the word and eager to begin their Rhema journey. In order to avoid detection, some had left their homes at 4 a.m. and walked 24 kilometers under the cover of darkness to the main campus. They were not disappointed. The relaunch was a great success, and testimonies continue to pour in from grateful students whose lives and ministries are being transformed by the anointed, practical ministerial training they're receiving at Rama. So praise God. You've been such a huge part of that. And uh, I'll have a follow-up to that after the next video, which is about the Congo. So we can roll that if we can get that one going real quick. In 2021... The first French-speaking Rhema campus on the continent of Africa launched with 315 students in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, often referred to as the DRC. This was the culmination of 35 years of collaboration from an international team of Rhema grads sharing a vision of bringing Rhema to the 34 nations and 11 territories of the French-speaking world. With 100 million inhabitants, the DRC is the largest French-speaking country on the planet. Kinshasa, with over 15 million, surpasses Paris as the largest French-speaking city in the world. It is estimated that by 2050, there will be 700 million French speakers, 85% of whom will be on the African continent. The center of the French-speaking world has solidly shifted to Africa, and the DRC is at the heart of this shift. In 2022, Enrollment at Rama Kinshasa grew to 396 students, representing 187 local churches. These students are serving as senior pastors, associates, or helps ministers in congregations of all sizes, including the largest, most influential churches in the nation. Collectively, they're influencing tens of thousands of Congolese throughout the country. Even the top general of the Congolese army is currently a student and has already planted four churches in the Eastern DRC. Several students currently living and pastoring on the war-torn Eastern border of the country invited the Rama Kinshasa team to do a conference for their leaders of their region. It was a historic event with the presidents of the largest Protestant denominations collaborating. Nearly 300 leaders were in attendance over a three-day period and the denominational leaders enthusiastically expressed their gratitude for the quality of teaching they received. Rama Kinshasa is off to a strong start. Students are overflowing with thankfulness for the revolutionary training they're receiving at Rama, and the best is yet to come. Amen. Praise God. So that's fruit to your account. Amen. And if we can just show, I'm just going to do a couple follow-up uh, to that video. Exciting things are happening. These are exciting days. You know, we see what's going on in the news. We hear the forecasts. And uh, we can see the signs of the times. We know that Jesus is coming soon. But before he comes, we have a job to do. Amen. And so if we can just um, flip through and uh, our dear... Can we give a big hand to our friends up here that are running the sound and the audio and visual? That's awesome. So let's go to the next slide just real quickly. And, uh, you know, this, this ministry is committed to this vision of church planting, ministry training, and 
publications throughout the nations of the French-speaking world. But we'll go real quickly, and I just want to highlight a couple things. Our vision is really to reach these 34 nations, 11 territories. It's going to be 700 million people we're talking about. So we're not just talking about France when we're talking about French here. Next picture, just real quick. Um, some highlights from just these are the most recent stats. To date, we've been able to train 1,428 French-speaking ministers that's a good deal, isn't it? Uh, just between the month of May and July of 2023, uh, we had five commencement ceremonies with 531 new grads in that three-month period on three continents and the Caribbean. And right now, as we speak, we have 699 students that are currently being trained. So, so you can see it took us a while to get to the 1,428, but it's not going to take us very long to keep multiplying. And that's what's exciting. So the best is really yet to come. Uh, next uh, picture real quickly. This um, is the charter class of Rama Kinshasa, the first French-speaking Rama Bible Training College campus on the continent of Africa. We had um, a great, amazing graduation in Kinshasa. Uh, I think we have another picture here. We mentioned the general. That's the general. Now, when we say he's the general, he's not a general. You know, there's three branches of the military in the Congo. You've got the Air Force, you've got a Navy, and you've got the Army. He's the one that's in charge of the Army. He has 200,000 soldiers that he's in charge of. And I'll tell you what, the guy loves Jesus. He loves God. He prays. And when, he, and when he's out in the East doing military campaigns, he's already planted four churches. And he just loves Jesus. His wife, too. His, his wife graduated also. So beyond church, look what you're doing. Amen. So the, the, next, the next slide, um, that's, that's the first class that graduated in Haiti. The next one would be 2018. That's our second graduating class. The next one is 2021. They were not, because of COVID and because of the civil unrest, weren't able to uh, have their graduation ceremony until May. So they were one of those five uh, graduations. And I want to show you another picture here. It's really exciting. Well, well you can tell how happy they are. Uh, next picture, this is, you know, Andy and Ruth Joseph, our campus coordinators. They are charter class grads of Rama Haiti, but they also travel with us, and they helped launch the campus in Haiti. They're the ones who trained all of our admin team and staff. The next picture is one of my favorite pictures of all time. This man on the left is Pastor Freddy Kazadi. He's from the Congo. He was a refugee chased at Machete Point from his home uh, because of tribal uh, problems. The, the stories he can tell uh, it, it is amazing how he escaped genocide. Amazing. God stories. God stories that I don't have time to tell, but two people raised from the dead on, on the train of death and everything. It's amazing. But he came to Quebec as a refugee, and he, was, and he had... Um, Gotten a good job, gotten a good education, was working for the government, and always had wanted to go to, to Rama, wasn't able to, and he found out it was in Canada and Quebec. So he came in 2008, so excited. The very first day, him and his twin brother walk up to, to uh, right in front of the pulpit and says, can we ask you a question, Pastor Ken? Do you plan on starting a Rama campus in the Congo? And we've been praying about it for a long time. We said, that's on the radar. We don't know when or how. And he, in 2008, he said, the day you start, I'll be there to help you. Amen. Well, he had this great job. And this is going to go in line with a little bit of what we're going to talk about today as well. But he had a great job. He had just gotten a promotion. He was going to get a big raise. He sits down at his desk. He takes his computer mouse. And as soon as he touched the computer mouse, he hears in his heart, he, said, he heard the Spirit of God say, resign, go back to Africa. I have a work for you to do. He says, I, I, that, you know, it's like, that can't be God. He, he said, I had to get up and go outside and walk around the building a couple times. He went back in, touched the mouse, and he heard a second time, resign, go back to Africa. I have a work for you to do. So he calls his wife, and his wife's like, what? <laughs> and I really believe, and uh, she says, well, I guess you have to obey God. So he did. He went back to Africa. But instead of doing what God called him to do, he got another job because now he's, he's a well-educated guy. He's got experience. He got a great job in Kinshasa that was going to pay him a lot of money, and, the, and he was going to work for about a week there, and all of a sudden he heard in his heart, that's not why I brought you back to Africa. I have a work for you to do. So he had to call his wife and say, I have to resign. 
She's like, could you at least wait until you get your first paycheck? No. <laughs> but he obeyed God. He planted four churches, and that was about four or five years before we got there to start the school in 2021. And guess what? Just like he said in 2008, fast forward to 2021, who was there the, the day we started? Yeah. Pastor Freddie. Amen? And he's the campus coordinator now. And so when they had the graduation in Haiti, because he's become close friends with Andy and Ruth, who work with us in Congo as well, they said, we have an idea. They won't let me go to Haiti right now because of the kidnapping. I stick out a little bit too much. But they said, we're going to ask Pastor Freddie if he'll come. And these guys, when they go to Haiti, they're there right now. I mean, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., the bell's going to ring, and they're going to be in class. 210 new students had signed up. Several of them had to leave the country, and I think they had 180 yesterday when they were in class out of the 210. But they're going to be there. So they, when they go fly into the country, they have to be led by the Spirit because they don't know exactly where the gangs are going to be, what roads they're going to have. Sometimes they have to take a boat. Sometimes they take the mountain roads. Uh, sometimes uh, the Spirit of God says, run the gauntlet and go straight through. And they're, they are putting into practice the Word of God. And it's a life or death situation whether or not you get it right or wrong. And so Freddie came, and he took the mountain road. So that's Pastor Freddie right there. So isn't, I don't know about you, but it, 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 for me, when I look at that, that's the fruit of the fruit. Yeah, we're not even there. You know, I, I logged in by Zoom and, uh, and, and said a few words at the commencement. He was a commencement speaker, and it was one of the best commencement uh, uh, um, messages I have ever heard in my entire life. And, and you know what? That's beyond church investment. Amen. That's taking and putting into faithful men who are able to teach others also. Amen. So I don't know if I think that may be the last. Is there any other pictures after that real quickly? Well, that's the students in Haiti uh, from just not too very long ago. That's the new students that just started the new class uh, of students that are in Kinshasa. So praise God. And so is that it? Or we have one or there's a vision 3411. Uh, those are the French speaking nations. Everything that's read is where we already have uh, schools planted and started. Exciting news. The, the, the school in, in France just received students, uh, uh, a student from New Caledonia, which is off the coast, uh, uh, not far from Australia, one of the French speaking uh, uh, territories. And so his pastor said, go to Rama, learn everything you can. Come back, and we're, we're going to believe God that one day Raymond's going to come to New Caledonia. So, you know what? That's been part of the prayer all along. So, God's doing it. Amen. So, our next steps, we're right now in the Congo. Tanya and I live primarily in the Congo right now. And uh, we already have the school there. You'll see the red with the little white dots. We have approval to start a school in the other Congo. That's the French Congo. We're what is called, yeah, the dark red here. Um, and so there's French Congo, Belgian Congo. We're living what was formerly the Belgian Congo, but we can see from our apartment, we can see the other Congo. And uh, anyway, we really believe God's given us a plan for the next nations that need to be targeted. And so we've got uh, things in the work for Cameroon. We have things in the work uh, for Ivory Coast and, and, and also Senegal. And then from there, we're looking at Benin and Gabon and... Um, and Burkina Faso also. But those are things that are coming. We're so grateful for what's already happened. But how many of you know the best is yet to come? Amen. So I just want to share that with you because that's, this is beyond church. Amen? Is that it? Are we, are we finished? There you go. If you want, you can go to uh, nations180.com if you want to sign up for our newsletter, become a partner, whatever is, is really uh, vital. We can't do. This church has partnered with us now for how many years, Pastor Nate? Five or six years. We can't do what God called us to do without partners. Amen? And what's exciting about it is it, partnership is that. It's a relationship uh, that God honors and that produces fruit for the kingdom. Amen? Praise God. So there you go. I think we ought to thank God for the people of the French-speaking world. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the nations that you're already touching. We thank you, Father, for the nations which will be touched in the days ahead in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. So how many of you have a Bible with you this morning? 
I wanted to take a little bit of time there, but I'm super excited about sharing the word this morning. Because when I heard the theme that uh, the Lord has revealed to, to the house here, preaching Jesus to everyone, everywhere. Can we all say it together? Everyone, everyone. everywhere everyone. needs to hear Jesus, needs to know Jesus, needs to experience Jesus. Amen? So we're talking about preaching, not just a doctrine, not just a, a, a tradition. We're talking about preaching a living gospel of a living God so that people can have a living experience with him. And that those who are dead can come to life. Amen? Amen. And so really when I heard that, I, I had already driving here from Missouri yesterday, I had a few scriptures stirring in my heart. And um, so hearing what Pastor Nate shared yesterday with us as we, we met and, and had a little bit of time to, to fellowship, uh, the theme just resonated within me, but it's like, okay, Lord, how exactly does that fit with those scriptures that I had? And I see it didn't take very long to see exactly how that fits. So first of all, I want, and I don't know if we have it up here. Here we go. Preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere. Acts 10, 38. I love this verse, especially in the French Bible. Because in the French Bible, it says, Nous savons comment Dieu a au moins du Saint-Esprit de force Jésus de Nazareth qui allait de lieu en lieu. And, it, and, and what that says in French is a little bit, even I think more, um, it's, it, the imagery of, of the French verse is even better. I'm going to give you a little translation. But how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about. That, everybody say went about. went about. You know? In French it says, Qui allait de lieu en lieu, who went from place to place. So it didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter if he was in Capernaum. It didn't matter if he was in, in Nazareth. It didn't matter where he was. He was always on the same mission. He always had the same objective. He always had the same goal in mind. We know in Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus went uh, throughout all the villages and towns. And what did he do? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He healed the sick, and he taught them, didn't he? He, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was healing. Everybody say preaching, teaching, healing. It, it was just in his DNA. It was, mo, it was his mode of operation. It was his MO. I go places, and what do I do? I do good. I heal. I set people free from the oppressive power of the devil. Amen? So that's, that's our Lord, Jesus. That's how he operates. That's his MO. And, and it's, it's obvious then, if you look at the next verse in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, that those who are followers of Christ, those who know Jesus, those who are believers in Jesus, those who have been born of the Spirit and, and who've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and planted into the kingdom of his dear son, the, we are, are supposed to have the same, the same MO, right? We're supposed to have the same DNA because we're born of him. As, as, he, as he was in the world, that's the same way we are, the apostle John said. And so if we look in Acts chapter 8, it says, therefore, those who were scattered, and we're talking about a scattering that took place, why? Because Saul of Tarsus, who was breathing threats, who was ravaging as a ferocious, uh, uh, a mad a beast, uh, tearing apart Christians, forcing them to blaspheme the living God. Uh, you know, we're talking about someone who was a terrorist, a, literally a terrorist, forcing people to blaspheme. That guy was uh, wreaking havoc on the church, and the church was scattered. But what happened when the church was scattered? Did the church just dissipate and die? No, the church got bigger. The church got stronger. The church went on with its mission. And so what I love about this, it says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere. Can we say everywhere? everywhere. Yeah. And what did they do everywhere? They were preaching the word then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So we're talking about preaching Jesus to everyone, everywhere. 
Why would, why, why, why would the Spirit of God speak that to your pastors? Why would he, he stir that in, in the heart of your pastors? Because that's what's in his heart. That's because who, that's who he is. That's, this is his word. It's his will. It's his way. It's what he desires. There's really, if you think about it, there's nothing more important There's nothing more important. You know, we can talk about economy. We can talk about this. We can talk about that. But all of that is is, is secondary and needs to serve the purposes of God's heartbeat, which is he wants his family redeemed. He wants those who are lost saved. He wants those who are sitting in darkness to see the light. He wants those that are in nations which are closed or nations which are, are, are oppressed. He wants them to be with him. Amen? And that includes everyone right here in the United States of America. And those in the state of Arkansas and those in in Alma, or I'm not sure the name of your county here or the surrounding counties, but he wants everyone everywhere to be saved. So it's great. And we're excited and we feel honored, Tanya and I, to be able to go into these other nations. We left our homeland in 92. The Lord told us to learn the French language, and, and we left, and we have never been back except to, for visits since 1992. And I'll tell you something, though. It was, it, was, it was hard at first. We had moments where we were homesick. We missed uh, family. We missed friends. And when our, our kids were young, we have five kids, and we have two grandbabies now, but they were far away from grandma, and they're far away from grandpa. And, 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 and that was hard at times. But I'll tell you what, if you obey God, amen, if you obey God, he will give you the desires of your heart. And so it's, we've gotten to the place, I don't know about you here in Arkansas, but growing up in in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s in, in Missouri, and it, even in the church world, it was kind of a joke. We'd say, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, except please don't send me to Africa. I mean, is, it, is that, that happened here in Arkansas too? Well, the other day we were in Kinshasa, and I, I told Tanya, I, I had this thought that came to me. It was kind of a scary thought. I thought, what if the Lord ever asked us to go back to America? <laughs> I said, Lord, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but I'd really rather not go back to America. And, and we love America. We love this country. But on the other hand, when you are in the right place where God has sent you and you're doing what he's called you to do, there's no place like the will of God. There's no place like the will of God. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I will share this real quick because otherwise I, I may forget to share it otherwise. Uh, but when the Spirit of the Lord spoke to us about going to, to Quebec, Canada, he said, go to Quebec, Canada, establish a base, and from there you can reach the nations of the French-speaking world. And then, and then there was a little parenthesis, but before you go there, you have to go to France. And we went to France for two years. That was in 92. And uh, right before we left, we had our, our son, our firstborn, who was 18 months when we left in August of 92. But just in the months prior... Uh, we had on our refrigerator in our little apartment, Tanya had a, a, a little paper. I'm not sure. Did you have a rainbow on it? You had some kind of little artwork you had done. But she wrote on that piece of paper, life is too short and eternity is too long not to do the will of God. Life is too short. Eternity is too long not to do the will of God. And so that was a reminder to us. You know what? God said to leave. We're going. We can't, we, can't, we can't afford not to do the will of God. Everybody, can we say that together? Life's too short. Eternity, it's too long not to do the will of God. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. And so the verse that I had in my spirit as I was driving down is in 1 Peter chapter 3. So let's go over there. We're just going to finish up today looking at a few things in 1 Peter chapter 3. I think we can go on to the next slide. I may have this, this verse up there. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read one verse here, and then we're going to slip over into chapter 4 and 
we're going to highlight a few things that I believe the Spirit of God wants us to see today. Amen? How many of you love His Word? Amen. Amen. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and we can, we can just look right here in um, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready. Look at your neighbor and say, always be ready. Always be ready for what? To give an account or a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And again, I like the French version of that because meekness and fear is good, but uh, it also talks about humbleness, humility, and respect. And so what the word is telling us is that, that we're being exhorted by the Spirit of God to, be, to live in a ready state so that no matter where we are, everywhere you might find yourself, whether it's here in Arkansas or in the next state over or in another country of the world, no matter where you are, no matter what uh, time of, of year, month, or day it is, you're ready. Look at your, the other neighbor and say, I'm ready. Ready, ready for what? Ready to give an answer, ready to give a defense to anyone who might ask you. And I like that part, too, because what that indicates is that we need to be living our lives in such a way, everywhere we are, that we are exuding hope, that people can see there's something different about the way he thinks, there's something the way, different about the way he acts, there's something different about the way he talks. Uh, he's not uh, a negative like everybody else is. All the bad stuff that's going on in the world doesn't seem to uh, get in him like it gets into everybody else. It, it doesn't seem to be upsetting him like it upsets me. What's going on? What's the difference? And when you're living in such a way, whether it's in your workplace or at your place of, of recreation on the golf course or whatever you're doing, and someone says, man, what's, what's up with you? We need to be ready. Everybody say, I'm ready. I'm ready. We're ready. We're ready to speak forth and to do what? To preach Jesus to everyone, everywhere. At work, at home, in the streets, at the grocery store. I'm ready. Amen? Amen. So today we're going to just look at how to be ready for everyone everywhere. And, and we're going to just go through these few scriptures. We're going to look at one, one chapter in chapter 4. We're just going to turn the page. And, and right here in this one chapter, we've got, we've got four things that the Spirit of God shows us and tells us that can help us to be to live our lives in a ready manner. Amen? The first thing we need to do if we're really going to be ready is we need to arm ourselves. And if we're, we're going to see in just a minute that this, this chapter specifically is going to highlight how a believer is supposed to live in a hostile world, in a world which is not uh, conducive to, to uh, uh, Christianity, which is not... Uh, friendly towards Christians, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to highlight how we are to live and act and be in that kind of an environment. And how many of you know that, that this country even, I know, is because we left in 92, we're, right now we, we can go around this nation and say, man, this is not the nation that I left in 1992. This is not the same place that I grew up in. This, people don't think the way they thought when we left 30-plus years ago. People don't act the way they act. They don't, they don't have the same values. They don't have the, the same way of thinking. There's some stuff that's, that's downright hostile towards Christians and Christianity. So, so what are we supposed to do about that? We're supposed to arm ourselves, right? Everybody needs an AR, well, maybe, but not, that, not for this purpose. You know? B believe me, I have, I, I, I've got plenty of firearms. That's okay. I mean, we're not talking, but, but we're talking about arming ourselves here. We're talking about in the spirit. We need to realize that we're not warring against flesh and blood. That our battle is not a, a physical even a political battle. Even though I think every believer needs to, 
to pray for the, their nation, pray for their leaders, vote, get involved, do what you can do, be on the school boards and do everything you can do to be an influence and be a light and let it shine. But I'll tell you what, there is no political answer to the problems of this world. There is no political answer. But there is an answer. And his name is Jesus. And he needs to be preached to everyone, everywhere. And in order to do that, because again, we're, we're coming out of, of chapter 3, verse 15. It says, be ready to give a defense for everyone who asks you of the hope. And then he goes on in chapter 4 and he says, what, what does he say? Let's, let's read it together. I love this. Uh, and I believe it is exactly what the Spirit wants us to hear today. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, arm yourself. Arm yourself also with what? With the same mind. There's a mindset. There's a mentality with the same mind. The mind for what? The mind for suffering. Okay, you say, wait a minute. I didn't think we preached suffering. We preach healing. We preach deliverance. We preach blessing. Yes, we do. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What Christ suffered in his flesh for our redemption, we don't have to suffer. Amen? It's not God's will for us to suffer in our bodies with sickness and disease. God never wants that. It's never his will for us to suffer with sickness and disease. But how many of you know that even Paul says that, that he considered all of the privileges he had in his life as, as nothing, as dung, as, as, as la boue, we say in French, in comparison to knowing him and, having, and, and really understanding the, the, the power of his resurrection and the what? The fellowship of his sufferings. And so... I think so many times we, we make a mistake because we skirt around some of the, some of the, the, the parts of, of our Christian life which maybe our flesh doesn't like to hear. I'll tell you what, following Jesus is the best thing you'll ever do. Amen? But there's a, there is still a price to pay to follow Jesus. Amen? There's, there are things that God's going to ask you to do, and your flesh is going to say, I don't want to do that. And so what do you have to do? Arm yourself. Arm yourself. The, the, the answer here is not shooting the people you disagree with, but it's, it's crucifying your own flesh and saying, you know what, God, not my will be done, but your will be done. We're following the, the lead of Jesus, who in the Garden of Gethsemane knew that in order for humanity to be saved, he had to go to that cross. He had to shed his blood. He had to descend into the lower regions. He had to suffer. The, the separation with the Father and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he said, Lord, if, he said, Father, if there's any way that I can get this job done without going through that, please let this cup get a, be, be a, a, removed from me. But not my will be done, but your will be done. So I believe when we're talking about arming ourselves, that's what we're talking about. Lord, we need to, all of us. How many of you want to see Jesus preach to everyone everywhere? Yes. That, you know what? I'm sorry, but there's no way around that. There's no, we want the resurrected life, but you can't have the resurrected life before going through the crucified life. Yeah. Amen? You can't skip the crucifixion and jump over to the resurrection. There's the, the, the person that we are has to be identified with the person he is in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. Amen? In order to become the one God wants us to be. And sometimes he's going to ask us to do things that on the out. You know, it was hard for us to leave in some ways, uh, family and, 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 and the like. And now, like I said... It was hard. I, I remember when we first arrived in France, my, my son was 18 months old. He was, he was walking, and we would hold hands. And, and the first few weeks we were there, every time I looked at my little boy, I would cry. Because I thought, oh, man, he's going to grow up without my, his grandma, without his grandpa clothes and everything else. And it just, my flesh was like, ah. You know, and, and I called my pastor one night. Praise God, for having, it's good to have a pastor, amen? I was just like, I need somebody to pray with me here. This isn't easy. Because I knew it wasn't just like, oh, this is a short-term trip. 
I knew this was like a life-altering decision that we had made. It totally changed the trajectory of our life. But you know what? There is joy in the resurrection. Amen? So, again, look at your neighbor and say, arm yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the good news is, when we crucify the flesh, we don't do that. We don't fight flesh with flesh. We fight it with the Spirit, and it's by the Spirit. Read Romans chapter 8. By the Spirit, we can put to death the deeds of the flesh. Amen? The second thing he says, okay, so so let's go on and read the rest of that. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And again, we're not talking about suffering with, with cancer or suffering with arthritis. I've had plenty of times where I'm suffering in the flesh and 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 I and, and I have sinned with my mouth because I've said, man, that hurts. <laughs> and uh, or complaining about things. Amen? So, he says this, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Circle that verse 2 in your Bible, if you would. And let's say it together. I'm no, I will no longer live the rest of my time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but I choose to live for the will of God. See, that's what we're arming ourselves with, that mentality. Life is short. I I looked at that picture of in St. Louis. I thought, my goodness, that's 40 years ago. I was 17 years old. I'm going to be 57 years old. Uh, and, and, And it doesn't feel like it's been that long. This life is but a vapor that appears for a moment and then vanishes away. That's why I want to make every day count. Everyone and everywhere, amen, needs to hear the gospel, and I need to make my life count. How about you? Verse 3, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in the lewdness, lust, drunkenness, and revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these things, they think it's strange. Who? The guys you used to party with. They think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation, and they speak evil of you. I'll tell you what. I found out who my friends were when I was 16. When I, when, when I stopped going to the beer parties, when I stopped uh, uh, doing the stuff they liked to do, they, they, they didn't really want anything to do with me. Amen. And I had to make a decision. Okay, so I've, I've wasted enough time in that stupid stuff. I want to do the will of God. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. And get, you know what? God gives his grace. He helps us. He gives us the strength, the power to do his will. He's the one who causes you to to will and to do of his good pleasure. So let's go on. So the second thing, be on lookout in prayer. And I think we've got it up here. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, if if the apostle Peter 2,000 years ago said, the end of all things is at hand, how many of you think, I don't know when Jesus is coming. Sorry, Pastor Nate, I can't tell you. It was a joke. I said, what do you want me to preach on tomorrow? And he says, well, tell us when Jesus is coming. And he was joking. I don't know when Jesus is coming. I know this. I know what Acts 1, 6 said when the disciples asked him, so tell us, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom? And, 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 and he said, his answer was, it's not for you to know the times and the epics which the Father set by his own authority, but you shall receive power and you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? Everywhere. Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the world, that's everywhere. Everyone say, that's everywhere. everywhere. Amen. And so what, what we've seen so far is this. Number one, we need to arm ourselves with a willingness to put the flesh to death and to say yes to God, even, and sometimes that means saying no to our fleshly desires. Number two, we need to realize that we are in the last of the last of the last days. Jesus is coming. We don't have any more time to waste, but we also need to be vigilant and, and prayerful. What kind of prayers are we to be praying? Here's one example. Here's one idea. You don't have to look it up, but write it down. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 6, where, where we see that we can pray. 
uh, so that the Lord would open doors, give us favorable opportunities to preach the gospel. And, and we can pray according to Ephesians 6 that he, we might be able to speak boldly as we ought. Those are the kind of prayers we can pray. God, give me divine appointments today. Lord, today there's somebody at my workplace, somebody that is going to be at the grocery store, someone that's going to be on the golf course that, that needs to know you. Give me an, a, a favorable opportunity. I'm being watchful. I'm armed. I'm ready. I'm ready to speak the word of God. I'm ready to share the love of Jesus. I'm ready to plant a seed in someone's heart. I'm ready to live in such a way that my hope inspires people to ask me, what's up with you? Give me a reason for this hope. Amen? Are you with me? Hallelujah. And so he goes on here in Peter, and he says this. Hallelujah. After, after verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all, have fervent love for one another, for the love covers, for love covers a multitude of sins. So the third thing we see is commit yourself to walking in love. These are real simple. Arm yourselves with a readiness to suffer in the flesh to do the will of God. That's the first thing. What was the second thing? Be watchful in prayer. The third thing is what? Commit to walking in love. You know what? The, the, Jesus said it in John chapter 13. He said, by this, all men shall know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. The most powerful evangelistic tool you have is love. Loving God, loving people, loving your neighbors, loving your enemies. I'll tell you what, that's what's going to incite them to ask, what is up with you? It's the love. And good news, Romans 5.5 5 says that love has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You have it. If you're in Christ, his love is in you. And you can be committed to walking in that love. Amen. And then finally, number four, serve. One word, yes. serve. Amen. I'm not making it up. Let's look at here. Oh, wait, I missed one. I did. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry. I, made, I, I, I have one, two, three. I put two number threes in my notes. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Refuse to grumble. I had it met wrong in my notes. So he goes on to say, love covers a multitude of sins. He, and and that aren't, how many of you are glad that love covers a multitude of sins? But then he says, be hospital to one another without grumbling. So you know what? We're living in a, in a, in a hostile environment. We're in enemy territory. We're, hey, I've got news for you. We're not home yet. I have news for you. This isn't heaven. News flash. Nothing will ever be perfect this side of heaven. Nothing. I remember even when, when Tanya and I, we, uh, we have five kids. We had two other girls living with us. So there's nine of us in the house. We had, we had all four of our boys were in, in two bunk beds uh, in, in one room. And, and the Lord opened a door for us to build a bigger place. Praise God. And what we did... It was really supernatural the way the Lord provided for us to, to do that. And it, it was nice. We, but we, had a, we actually had brick front on the house. But for some reason, they had one brick that was the wrong color. It was from the wrong lot. And so you, walk, you drive up the house, and my eye always went to that one brick. It's like, they got that one wrong. And then when they put the floor in, they had one piece of flooring that was the wrong color. And it, was, it, would, it irritated my flesh until I, I, I heard, this is just me, I heard in my spirit, it was like the Lord's like, just a reminder that you're not home yet. I'm not saying he did it, but it's like, hey, you see stuff that's not perfect, you see stuff that's not right, don't grumble about it, don't complain, just say, hey, we're not home yet, we're on mission. We're in the army, we're armed. We're, we, we, we are active duty. We're on the front lines, and, 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 and there's incoming. And it's not always easy. And sometimes we're taking flack. Amen? And sometimes we've got to pull some shrapnel out. Right? And, but you know what? We're not home yet, but, but grumbling's not going to get us any further. Rejoicing will. Hallelujah. So we go from the no grumbling. He finishes up this exhortation here. Uh, 
in verse, we could go to the next, the next slide. Serve. And I, and I love this verse. It says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Did you know that you're gifted? You know, we had, when I was in school, we had gifted classes. I was not always in the gifted classes. Okay? But the problem is we had this idea that, oh, you have gifted people and you got people that aren't gifted. You know what? A, there, there is no such thing as a believer in Jesus Christ who is not gifted. It doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. The Word says that. So what does it say? It says, and look at that verse again, as each one has received a gift. Look at your neighbor and say, you've received a gift. You might not know what it is yet. That's why we need to do the four Ds. We need to, we need to, we need to discover it. We need to uh, develop it. All right? The three Ds, I'm sorry. And then we need to deploy it. Your giftedness, is you have a 3D gifting. You need to discover, develop, and deploy that gift. And there's no better place to do that than right here in the, in the context of the local church. But it says, as each one of you has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards. It, you've received it, but it's not really yours. You're just, you're just really stewarding, you're managing the gift that God's given you. And one day, guess what, my friends, me, you, all of us, one day we're going to meet the gift giver, and he's going to say, so what'd you do with it? He already knows what we did with it, but have you ever noticed that Jesus always asked questions even about the things he knew? You know, he's before the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, well, it's kind of obvious. I want to see but he wants us to say. And so I, I, believe, I believe that one day we're going to give an account for everything we've done on this earth. And, and he's going to ask me, what, so what did you do with this gift that I gave you? And if you say, well, I didn't know I had a gift. You're not, that's a lie because I just told you this morning you do. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Everybody say, I'm gifted. I'm Look at another person say, you are gifted. Look at someone else say, I need your gift. Need Amen. We're talking about preaching Jesus to everyone everywhere, but do you know this is part of it? It's part of it because as the body, every joint supplies, we bring our, our supply to the body. The body builds itself up in love. We're not called just as individuals to preach the gospel. We're called as a body to preach Jesus. Yeah. And I love that even about, you look in Acts chapter 13 when the Apostle Paul, everybody talks about the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul. But you know, Paul in Acts 13, the Spirit of God said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work unto which I've called them. I don't believe that we're called as individuals. I believe we're called as a body. It's not about the big eyes and the little U's. We're all in this together. We all have a measure of God's spirit. We've got to discover it, develop it, deploy it. And, and you know, even Paul, the great apostle Paul, in, in Romans chapter 16, he mentions by name 27 coworkers, men and women. And he, and he mentions their value to the ministry. Amen. So we have a gift. We need to take, discover that gift, and we need to put it into service of the body. So let's finish that verse real quick here. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers or serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 I'm going to walk in that. I love that, Pastor Nate. Are we going to walk in that? Are we going to, how many of you, I don't want you to just hear this, but there's some things that the Spirit of God is wanting to do in this church, in this community, and throughout the world. And if, if we can take a hold of these, these principles we just underlined, if, if we can be fully armed with a readiness and a willingness and a mindset of God, I, not my will be done, but your will be done. I'm ready even to suffer in my flesh, if necessary, to do your will. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of that. Amen? And I'm also 
understanding that, that we're in enemy territory. I need to be watchful and seriously praying for God to open doors every day of my life, whether I'm at school or I'm at work or wherever. God, give me an open door. I'm watching. I'm watching. Help me to speak boldly as, as you want me to speak. I'm praying about these things. So we're armed. We're praying. We're committed to walk in love because our love walk is going to demonstrate Christ better than anything else can demonstrate who he is. We're going to refuse to grumble. We realize we're not home yet. There's things that are going to go well, things that are sometimes going to go poorly. We're not going to complain. We're not going to grumble. We're going to have a good attitude of gratitude. We're in the trenches. Sometimes the enemy onslaught seems seems a, a little overwhelming to the, to the flesh, but you know what? In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Everybody say we're more than conquerors. And we're going to commit ourselves to finding, to di- discovering, developing, and deploying the gifts we have. Can we stand to our feet? I don't know what else we'd stand to, but we always have we say that. But. Maybe we should say, should we, could we stand to our knees? Did you get anything out of this today? Is the Spirit of God speaking to you today about how you can be prepared to preach Jesus to everyone, everywhere, 24-7? It's not just about Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, or whenever else. It's, 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 this, is, this is about who we are. This is our MO. This is our DNA. This is... This is, what we, this is how we roll, as they say. This is what we do. We love God. We love people. Hallelujah. And we share Jesus with everyone. And we do it everywhere. We share Jesus with everyone. And we do it everywhere. We do it all the time. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful blessed church. I thank you for the heart of the the shepherds that you've given to this body. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for the heart of every member of this family. And it is a family. Lord, we don't want to just do church. We don't want to just do religious things. We want to really know you. Jesus, you've, you've, you've given it all. Jesus, you shed your blood. Jesus, you suffered in your flesh. You suffered in your soul. You you were separated from your Father. Lord, you, you paid the price because you love us, because you're for us, because you're so good and you're so faithful. Lord, everyone in this place, is precious to you. There's not one person in this place that you didn't die for. There's not one person in this place that you haven't already written about in your book. There's not one person in this place who hasn't already had a plan prepared before the foundation of the world. There's not one person in the sound of my voice today that is not gifted There may be people in this place who haven't yet discovered you, haven't yet yielded to you, haven't yet chosen to obey you. Not with a partial obedience, but with a full obedience. Full obedience. Full obedience. Just listen in your heart today. I'm going to count to three, and if you're here today and you've never yet I'm going to give two, two, two invitations. If you've never yet said yes to Jesus, maybe you believe in your head that he's the son of God. Maybe you've struggled with that. Maybe you haven't been sure and your, your mind is still not sure right now. I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you listen to your spirit and you listen to your heart, God's put eternity into your heart. The sense and the notion of eternity, you know deep, deep down that there's more to this life than just this world and just this life of natural things. Something inside of you is telling you, yeah, there really is a God and 
Something's telling me that Jesus really is alive and Jesus really died for me and he was really buried and he really did raise, from the, raise up from the dead. Even if you've got your mind that says, ah, that doesn't make sense, listen to your heart today. Listen to your heart. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus and you'd like, I, I wanna pray with you. I'm gonna count to three. And, and on three, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, just raise your hand. Anybody here need to give your life to Jesus? One, two, three. Just raise your hand up. Everybody here has? I'm gonna just take a second because I think there's somebody who needs to raise their hand. And Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. He loves you. Anybody? You might be watching online. And if you are, we're going to pray this prayer. If you haven't prayed this prayer before, just pray this with me. Let's, let's repeat this prayer. Father, I come to you and I give you my life. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I know he died for me. I know he was buried. And I believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead. I commit my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, today, I'd also like to, and if you prayed that prayer, if you're watching online, you need to contact people here at this church, and they can get you on those first steps and help you grow in your faith. But if you're here today, and you just kind of sense a tugging in your spirit, you just want to make a recommitment. You're not, not, it doesn't mean you're walking in sin or your life's out of order or anything, but there's just something, and I'm going to be the first one to pray the prayer myself with all sincerity. I want to do the will of my Father. I want to know Jesus like I've never known him. I want to make him known. I want to preach Jesus to everyone everywhere like never before. If there's anyone here who would like to join me in that, I'm raising both my hands. Anybody want to join me in that prayer? Just with our hands lifted to him, let's pray this together. Father, I want to be ready to preach Jesus to everyone, everywhere. And I'm arming myself with this mindset. By your spirit, I can put to death the deeds of the flesh. And I can do your will. I seriously choose to pray and to watch and to keep guard and to be vigilant. Open doors, even today. Divine appointments. Favorable opportunities to share your love. And Lord, I commit to walking in love to never grumbling and to discovering my gift, developing my gift and deploying that gift so that as a body, we can preach Jesus to everyone, everywhere in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. for that. That was very, very special, very honored. Take a message and put it together after a conversation at nine o'clock at night. Bless you. Praise God. We're on mission. That's what it comes down to. We're on mission. We're on mission. Father, thank you for that. We bless Canon. Tanya, uh, uh, I just, in my heart, as we were getting ready to, um, we always prepare something for our guest ministers uh, as a house, as a church. But if you want to sow into them as well, um, you can go on there and just make a tab, or you can, uh, and you can, I don't know, right now, a separate thing. How would you do that, Landon? Yeah. Just put, put, put their name, um, and we'll, anything extra that comes in, we'll give that to them. Um, what a blessing today. But we're so generously uh, as a house uh, in my heart. So 
we're gonna we were just doubling that. The Lord said double that this morning. And uh, thank you, Lord. God bless you. Have a great week. Be on mission. Set your expectation for God to move as you go out these doors. Amen. God bless you.